and every time you talk about this, people immediately begin to think, well, he's getting into works. He's getting into works. He's getting into works. He is not getting into works. He's and that is, that is why this verse of Scripture is so incredible because it says that Christ did all that he did that these righteous requirements would be fulfilled in you. Not that these righteous requirements would be fulfilled in him. We know all the righteous requirements of the law were fulfilled in Christ in the life that he lived for us and in the offering he gave on our behalf. But now he's talking about the righteous requirements of the law being fulfilled in our lives. And he's saying that the people that have no condemnation on them, the evidence that they have no condemnation on them and something that plays to their assurance that they have no condemnation now and no condemnation later is that they are the people that are experiencing by the grace of God something that the other people of this world are not experiencing and that is that the righteous requirements of the law are being fulfilled in them. They have a desire for it. They have a passion for it. They have a yearning for it. They have a hunger and a thirst from God for it. They want it. They desire it. They yearn for it. They, it's something that they must have. That's how they feel about it inside their hearts. And they don't just feel about it this way in their hearts. They actually want to see the actuality of it in their life. And this is not true about those that are after the flesh, that mind the things of the flesh. Those, those people could care less about becoming like Jesus or the righteous requirements of the law being a part of their life or anything whatsoever. That's why when you find these people that, that fit what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, where they called him Lord, Lord, and they said, didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name, Lord? He says, depart from me. I never knew you. He said... Uh, you don't do the will of my Father. In other words, they, their interest was not in the will of the Father, which was the purpose for which Christ came, which was that the righteous requirements of the law would be fulfilled in their life. They had no mind for that. They had no interest in that. What did they have interest in? They had interest in mysticism, spiritual phenomena, the signs, that have, didn't we do all these great things in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? Didn't we do all these mighty things in your name? They were all excited about these outward things, but they weren't interested at all in this most important thing of holiness becoming a part of their life. See, the scripture says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So right now, God is making us holy, and he's going to make us completely holy one day when we come to be, when, when Jesus comes for us. But holiness is an absolute, absolute, absolute fact in every Christian's life. And if you find a person that takes holiness lightly, takes righteousness lightly, takes living for God lightly, that person, no matter if they come to this church or they go to some other church, I automatically put a big question mark over them if they have ever been saved. If they take God lightly. When God saved me, from the moment he saved me, I could not take him lightly. I could not ignore him. I couldn't avoid him. I couldn't, I couldn't walk around him. I couldn't live without him. I couldn't try to live without him. I couldn't try to do my own thing. I couldn't. Because every time I did, I got spanked over it. Every time I, tried to, every time I did it, I got corrected over it. And, or every time I, I ever did anything like that, I felt sick about it and sad about it. And cried about it. But before the Lord saved me, none of those things bugged me or bothered me. I just, it just it never existed. These things can only be fulfilled in those that are in Christ Jesus. They are those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. They don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Why would someone walk according to the flesh? Is because they are flesh. They're born of the flesh. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. And they cannot mind the things of the Spirit. They're only going to mind the things of the flesh. Verse 5. Let's turn there and look. Verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh, what do they do? They set their minds on the things of the flesh. Now, you remember that before you were saved, don't you? Remember how you set your mind and dancing and drinking and carrying on and and, and uh, 
even doing wonderful things like going to church, going to ball games and what have you. You did all those wonderful things. But you know what? One thing about all those things you did, whether they looked like sin or didn't look like sin, know it was common in all those things that you did. You did them without any mind for God, any concern for God. See, the person who's after the flesh that minds the things of the flesh, he can be a drug dealer, a prostitute, uh, a homosexual, or they can be a religious Catholic, a bishop in the Catholic Church, a pastor in this church. They can be, they can be, they can be any of these individuals. Somebody who looks like they're living in raw sin, somebody who's looking like, living, looking like they're just living a very, very good moral life. But in both scenarios, the life that they're living, they're living without God. God is not in the midst of their concerns. God is not, God is not their interest whatsoever. They're living without God. When my dad and I went fishing, that's a good thing to do. But we did it without God. God wasn't in our conversation. God wasn't in our, he wasn't in our pursuits. When I went hunting with him and did all the things I did, enjoyed all the things I did, nothing wrong with it. That, just an just a everyday thing. But I was walking after the flesh because I was doing all that with no pursuit of God in my heart. And that's basically what it means. Do you remember the scripture when Jesus had to turn and rebuke um, Peter? And he says, you're more mindful of the things of men than the things of God. What was happening there? Peter was in a position in his own mind that the things of the men were more important to him than the things of God. And that's what it means to mind the things of the flesh. You're minding things that are acceptable in the eyes of men. Philosophy is acceptable in the minds of men. Political things are. Cultural things are. But your whole pursuit in those streams are, is a pursuit that does not have God's interest, God's glory in mind whatsoever. But see, those of us that that's in Christ Jesus in whom there's no condemnation, the righteousness of the law, righteous requirements of the law are being fulfilled in us because we're not that way any longer. We're no longer minding the things of the flesh. We're no longer minding things without a pursuit of God in our life. But what are we doing? We're minding, verse 5 says, but according, not, we do not walk according to the flesh, but we walk according to the Spirit. We're walking according to the Spirit. Why are we walking according to the Spirit? Because we've been born of the Spirit. Something supernatural outside of ourselves, without any help from us, took place for us. God caused us to be born of His Spirit. When God caused us to be born of his spirit, repentance came into our hearts, faith came into our hearts, assurance came into our hearts, and minding the things of the spirit came into our hearts. God is the author of that from beginning to end. That's not something we did that God might do. That's something that God did that we might do. Verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, verse 6, is death. Now, when you read that phrase, carnally minded, it actually means the same thing, those that are mind the things of the flesh. Carnally minded means the same, exact same thing as it says, minding the things of the flesh. So to be carnally minded or to mind the things of the flesh is death. It's death because it proves that you're dead. It proves that you're dead to God. And because you're dead to God, there's no pursuit of God whatsoever in your life. God is in none of your interests. He's in none of your concerns. Uh, it doesn't matter to you if he exists or he doesn't exist. What really matters is that you exist. And so the things that matter to him don't matter to you. And so the carnal mind, to be carnally minded is death. Now, do you notice how this cannot, this cannot uh, point to a carnal Christian and a spiritual Christian? Because even a baby Christian or a Christian, uh, this weak Christian that sometimes gets the term that he's carnally, carnally minded, there is a pursuit of God in that person's life. 
there's a pursuit of God. But in this person's life, there is not a pursuit of God because that person is spiritually dead. He's alienated from God. He's never been born of God. And all that he does is nothing more than a product of what he is, and that is death. He goes on to say, but to be spiritually minded, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now notice, to be spiritually minded is whatever you do in this life. If you're a, a, a parent, a spouse, a grandparent, if you're a, a worker at school, where, wherever your employment might be, whatever things you like to do with the outdoors, whatever you do, you, are, you do it with a pursuit of God in your heart. That's why the person that, uh, the person who, uh, me and Rick are out bow hunting, the person that's in the tree stand, that after the flesh, and minds the things of the flesh, he cannot enjoy his hunting experience near as much as the guy that's born of the Spirit. Can't. Because if nothing happens, you're still happy. <laughs> you belong to God. The other guy, he's depressed and going home and, and he's sad about everything. And, but you're, you're, you're full of joy because you're spiritually minded. You have a pursuit of God going on in your life. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You have been blessed of God to have such a hunger and such a thirst in your heart. And so you're spiritually minded. You have been born of the spirit. You were once born of the flesh and and whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, but whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. So now you have been born of the Spirit. That means you have been enlightened by the Spirit. You have been regenerated. You have been placed in Christ Jesus. You have been placed in this realm of grace. And in that, you cannot help but be spiritually minded, minding the things of the Spirit with a pursuit of God in your heart. And that's what that means. You have a pursuit of God. That's the most simplest way. There's a lot of definitions I've read but the one that resonates the greatest is that there's a pursuit of God in your heart. Uh, A.W. Tozer wrote a book called The Pursuit of God. And when he wrote that book, he was basically just telling the Christians what it's like to be spiritually minded, to pursue God. Now, a lot of times people think, well, I'm going to go to that Holy Ghost meeting and, 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 and I'm going to get around all these manifestations and what have you. You could do that and not even do that with a pursuit of God in your heart. You might do that with a pursuit of entertainment in your heart. Now, a lot of you know that I've been through all of these things. And I remember going to one meeting one time, and I told you about it. Everybody wanting to get in there and get close to the preacher that was preaching, and they ran over a pregnant woman that was standing there, just opened the door, knocked her down, stepped over the top of her, just left her laying there. They wanted to get up there where the so-called anointing was. Get up there where the power is. Get, a, uh, get up there under the gun barrel, as they used to talk about it. Stupidity times a thousand. Well, you got a pregnant lady laying back there. You're up there sitting in your chair talking about how wonderful the power of God is and the spirit of God is. and I mean, absolute foolishness. But they were the people that thought they were on the cutting edge of the move of God. Think about this. And I know Christians in my family, perhaps in your family, in everybody's family. I've been around uh, as a Christian since 1976, seen and heard a lot of things. I've been in meetings where the Spirit of God was truly manifesting, where there was no mixture. What do you mean by mixture? Some of it was the devil, some of it was the flesh, and some of it was the Holy Ghost. He had a hard time discerning what was what. But I've been in meetings where, there, where it was truly the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you the impact it has. The impact when the Spirit of God is moving like that is that people hunger for Christ. People hunger to know Him, hunger to be closer to Him, hunger to know everything about redemption, everything about their union with Christ, everything, everything about what it means to be a Christian. They hunger for that. They long for it. They thirst for it. They want it. But if I get around some people, they told me that they got filled with the Holy Ghost, they're speaking in tongues, and I don't see them wanting God. Then I find out about, well, how did you get speaking in tongues? 
Well, they laid hands on me and they told me what to say. Or they started saying something, they said, no, go do what I do. All the people that ever have done that happen to them, they never got filled with the Holy Spirit unless God, by his Holy Spirit, somehow jumped in there and helped them out. But most of that, that's why, I mean, these people that phone you up and say, I can get your mom or I can get your brother or I can get your little sister uh, speaking in tongues, that's what they do. They pray for them over the phone, they tell them what to say, and they get them saying it. So these people think they're all speaking in tongues. A lot of foolishness, times a thousand, times a thousand, a thousands of thousands of thousands of foolishness. This is what it is. To be spiritually minded is that you have a pursuit for God, and when God manifests himself in one of these extraordinary ways, it has an impact upon your life that you want to be more pure, you want to be more holy, you want to live more uprightly, you want to be more pleasing, you want to be walking more circumspectly, you want to be more God-honoring, God-fearing, God-adoring, God-worshipping. You want to know your Bible more, you want to know uh, about Christ more, you want to know more about redemption. And let me tell you something, folks, if those things are not in your heart and in your life, begin to pray and begin to seek God and say, God, may this be the reality of my soul. Because if we're growing as Christians, this is the things that I'm talking about are the things that ought to be stoked up and fired up inside of our hearts. If you can be a Christian and none of these things matter to you, it's like no big deal. Why is a pastor always get so excited about this stuff for? I feel sorry for you. I really do. I feel so sorry for you. Because... You're being robbed. You know what the scripture says right here? To be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Life, without going into great detail, Apostle Paul talked about it all through chapter 6 and in chapter 8, even chapter 5, and it's being alive unto God. To be spiritually minded means you're alive unto God. That you have Life with God because of Christ. You're alive unto God. You're not dead in sin. You're no longer re a rebel. You're no longer going contrary to him. You're no longer minding the things of the flesh and minding the things that, that men are interested in. There's a pursuit of God. You're alive unto God. You have a pursuit of God. And the end of that pursuit is peace. Not only peace with God, but peace in your life. Oh, yeah, you got a thunderstorm going on at work. You got a thunderstorm in your home and your family. You got a thunderstorm circumstantially in a lot of areas of your life, but you have peace because you're spiritually minded. You have a hot pursuit of God in your heart for the things of God. And that hot pursuit of God in your heart, folks, is the Holy Ghost. And this, a lot of Christians don't realize this. They, they got this dumb idea times a thousand. And the dumb idea is that God's just going to do all this for me. He is not going to do all this for you. And if you think that way, you're absolutely wrong. God's at work within you, both the will and to do his good pleasure. He's always moving and motivating and he's coaxing. He, he has preachers get up and preach to you. He illuminates verses of scripture to you. But ultimately, you're in a responsible relationship with God. You're responsible to give heed to it. Why do you think there's scriptures in the Bible that says give heed to these things? lest these things slip. You know, if you don't give heed to the word of God that's being given to you, these things will slip. Read the book of Hebrews. Give heed to these things, lest they slip. Give heed to these things, lest they slip. Give heed to these things, lest they slip. You read 2 Peter about that if you do this, and this, and this, and this, and add to this, and add to that, I thought God's supposed to add it all to you. God is at work to that end. He's the means within you to that end. But because when he saved you, he called you into a responsible relationship with him. And a responsible relationship with him means that when he has worked in you, you're working out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And the reason why that passage there with fear and trembling is because he explains it. Because God is at work within you. And you recognize that he's at work within you. And so anytime I'm reading the Bible and verses of scripture are being illuminated to me, or I'm listening to somebody teach and preach and something's coming across to me, or someone's admonishing me or exhorting me, 
I don't stop and think, well, that's just that preacher. That's just that preacher. No, I stop and think, this is God wanting to talk to me. God's wanting to say something to me. He's wanting to get me stirred up. Christians come and say something to me. The Lord's using this to stir me up. The Bible says uh, for us as Christians in Ephesians chapter 4 that we're to speak the truth to one another in love that we may grow up into him in all things. In other words, our conversation with one another as Christians ought not just be hunting and fishing and bowling and golfing and, and the Hawkeyes and, and, um, and the Packers and the Bears and uh, all of that stuff. And just, that, it's just that's our, all of our conversation. Our conversation ought to be an incredible interest in one another's spiritual well-being. Where we say things to each other out of love and out of kindness, out of concern for our spiritual well-being, that we want things that will encourage, that will stoke up the furnace again and get ourselves stirred up for God again. Can you say amen? amen. I got a minute. What's next? For to be carnally minded is death, verse 6, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Watch this now. Because the carnal mind is at enmity. Enmity means hostility against God. Now, if this doesn't prove right here that the Apostle Paul is not talking about two kinds of Christians, I don't know what is. Because the carnal mind is not only death in verse 6, the car, the, because the carnal mind is an enmity, enmity against God. Remember, it's death because you're spiritually dead. And as so all it does is produce death because the carnal mind is enmity against God. To be spiritually dead is to be in, at enmity against God, hostile against God. Now, how can you be a Christian, and even so, a so-called carnal Christian, or a baby Christian, or a fleshly Christian, all these ideas that are out there, and be hostile towards God? Now, the very first thing that happened to you when you got saved is you were reconciled to God, and you have peace with God. So Paul's not talking about two kinds of Christians. Fleshly Christians and spiritual Christians. He's talking about people that are dead in their sins. He's talking about people that are in the flesh, people that are under the law, the dominion of the law. They're under the dominion of sin. They're slaves to sin. And those individuals are at enmity against God. And watch this here. They're not subject to the law of God. They're not subject to the law of God. That means they're not subject to the righteous demands of God. They can't subject themselves to the righteous requirements of the law. They're not subject to the law of God. They can't. They're not. They have no desire for it. They're hostile towards it. Yuck. Yuck. <laughs> ah, get away from me. They don't like that stuff. They don't like the God who's given it. They like their idea of God, but they don't like a righteous God who gave a law. They're not able to submit themselves to it. They have no desire for it. They, they don't want nothing to do with it. And they'll say, listen. That's not, that's, the carnal minded, minded person cannot only not subject themselves to the law of God, they cannot even subject themselves to the gospel. The gospel is the highest standard of the law of God. They can't even subject, it to, subject themselves to that. Why? Because of their nature. They're dead. They're separated. They're alienated from God. They don't like God. They don't like his righteousness. They don't like the fact that he's holy. They don't like the fact that he's sovereign. They don't like the idea that God is almighty and God is, is, rules over all. They don't like that idea. They're okay with God if he just forgives me. And that's another thing. A lot, there's this idea in the church that I'm forgiven. You ever see a bumper skipper? Not perfect, just forgiven. See that? Not perfect, just, just forgiven. No, you're more than just forgiven. No, we know you're not perfect. Don't worry about that. Everybody who's looked at you knows that. But we're more than just forgiven. We're in Christ. We're no longer slaves of sin. We're slaves of righteousness. We're slaves of Almighty God. We've been born of the Spirit. We're in the realm of grace, the rule of grace. We're not in that rule and realm of sin any longer. We're not in Adam. We're in Christ. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. We've been delivered from the powers of darkness. We've been translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. We belong to Almighty God. We are saints. We are the saints of God. We're different. We're not only just forgiven. We're not only just justified. We've been placed in Christ Jesus. We've been made free from the law of sin. And God's spirit is at work within us. And the righteous requirements of the law by the spirit of God are being fulfilled in our life. Yeah. We're different. Yeah. And, and there used to be this dumb idea. Well, just take it easy, brother. I mean, my Lord. They're forgiven. 
God forgave them. Why don't you forgive them? Why they're living just like the devil, have no interest in God whatsoever. I try, try to tell people, these folks aren't saved. They have no mind for God. God's not in their pursuits. Oh, you're just saying that because you don't like dancing or you don't like movies. Hey, dance all you want and go to all the movies you want, but make sure there's a hot pursuit of God in your heart. And if there is, you'll be able to get out of that movie when they start cussing and cursing and taking off their clothes. And when you're, and you're dancing in front of somebody and they're moving around and wiggling like they ought not be moving around and wiggle when they, talk to, when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll get your butt out of there. But what happened to me all of a sudden? No, it's so, ridiculous. it's so ridiculous when you think about the fact that God has saved us, and we think that saving us just meant that he forgave us, and he's taking us all to heaven. Oh, I'm so happy. Well, I live like the devil. To be carnally minded is death, for the carnal mind is hostile. Hostile. Against God. How does it prove itself that it's hostile against God? For it's not subject to the law of God. It can't even begin to subject itself to the things that God wants for their life. And so when a person starts talking about, I'm forgiven, and don't, don't talk to me about these things. Like some churches, you know what some churches do? Some churches say you've got to have accountability partner. Yeah. Kind of accountability partner. Oh, you want to be my accountability partner? <laughs> if I do something wrong, will you tell me? Will you help me to do right? Stupid. So everybody say stupid. Times a thousand, times a thousand. How come in the New Testament we don't have accountability partners? How come in the New Testament we don't have um, celebrate recovery? You don't have none of this nonsense. I tell you why you have these things in the church today is because you got a lot of false converts in the church today. And you got a lot of preachers that don't know the Bible no longer. They know Reader's Digest. They, knew, they know the books of all the people that write stuff that don't know the Bible. And that's why we're stuck with this. But the Bible says right here, look at this. Because the carnal, because the carnal mind is enmity or hostile against God for or because it's not subject to the law of God, watch this, nor indeed can be. In other words, they couldn't be if they wanted to be. And they wouldn't want to be because they can't be. What this verse of Scripture is telling us is that man is so incredibly lost, he's more lost than he would ever know that he is. He is so completely lost. And there's no way that anything that God desires of him can be found in him. Because there's absolutely no pursuit of God in his heart. But the person that is spiritually minded, that's totally different. Because that spiritually minded person has something that was placed in his heart from God. And that is a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. It is a pursuit for God. It is a yearning desire to know God and to be pleasing to God and to walk upright before God. The scripture says this in, in 1 John. It says, we receive from him whatever we ask because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. For we keep his commandments. The Christian loves keeping his commandments. The Christian loves doing what God wants for them. So I don't know if I love what God wants to mean. I don't know if I got a pursuit for God. And I don't know if I'm hungry and thirsty for righteousness. I mean, I'd just rather just take it easy. I mean, I don't want to come around here anymore. You just get too excited about God. Boy, you better look out. That's the way you feel. I'm trusting me. I don't care, you've been in this church 20 years. You haven't been around that long, so if you've been here 20 years, you've come a long time. It doesn't make any difference, but if that's how you feel about it, something is not right down here. May God have mercy on your soul.